A very good afternoon, Mr. S. Ishuran, Minister for Trade and Industry, Republic of Singapore, Your Excellencies, Mr. S. Chandra Das, Singapore's High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, Mr. Nima Viraratna, Sri Lanka's High Commissioner to Singapore, Ambassador Gobinath Pillay, Chairman of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore and Ambassador at Large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Singapore, Professor Rezin Sally, Chairman of the Institute of Policy Studies at Sri Lanka and Senior Advisor to the Ministry of Finance, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Ayubawan. It gives us great pleasure to have you with us today at the second ISAS Colombo Colloquium 2018. The topic of today's colloquium is Singapore and Sri Lanka, partners in a fast-growing region. This evening's colloquium marked the second edition of the ISAS Colombo Colloquium series here. And to start the proceedings, it's my pleasure now to invite Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, Chairman of ISAS and Ambassador at Large, to deliver his welcome remarks. Ambassador, please. Mr. S. E. Swaran, Minister of Trade and Industry, Singapore. Mr. Dimal Veera Ratne, Sri Lanka High Commissioner to Singapore. Mr. Chandra Singapore's non-resident High Commissioner to Sri Lanka. Professor Razin Sally, Chairman, Institute of Policy Studies. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of ISAS and IPS, let me welcome you to this second colloquium that we are having in Sri Lanka. I'm very happy to have Mr. Ishwaran as a guest. Uh, we were not sure the day the event could, have, could be done because there were so many meetings and so many uh, events that I think it was really Mr. Ishwaran's kindness that made it possible to have this uh, program. The program is three in three parts. First, uh, the minister will make a few opening remarks, and then they will have a dialogue, which will be chaired by Professor Razin Sally, uh, the IPS chairman. Then the third part will be that we sign uh, MOU with IPS. We, meaning ISAS, will sign an MOU with, uh, with uh, uh, IPS. Uh, this is the second one, as uh, Sitara mentioned, second colloquium that we are having. The first one was held in 2004, and uh, the chief speaker from Singapore side was Mr. S. Shanmugam, then foreign, foreign minister, and uh, from uh, yes, Sri Lanka side, it was uh, Professor G. L. Perez. It went off very well and uh, very well attended. Today's uh, subject is extremely appropriate and very, very topical, I would say because uh, when you're talking about Singapore and Sri Lanka partnering in a fast-growing region, today is the day when our minister and his counterpart in Sri Lanka signed the FTA in the presence of our prime minister and the president of Sri Lanka. This is, a, as, uh, as it was mentioned in the statement by the ministry of Sri Lanka, it is an extremely significant event. Why is it significant? Because this is the first time in 10 years that Sri Lanka has signed such an agreement with a country. And they have signed it with a country which has the most liberal economy in Southeast Asia, giving a strong signal that Sri Lanka is open for business. It wants to connect with the world and develop its economy in a, uh, with trade and commerce as the major issue. And uh, we are very happy that uh, we could have it in this very timely fashion immediately after the signing. And I want to congratulate uh, the minister for having success. Because it started, the discussion started, I, if I remember correctly, August 2016 or something. And uh, it is in terms of uh, Negotiations for FTA, this is, one, I would think, one of the quicker ones because some languished for a long time before they, some new uh, life breath is uh, pumped into them and they start moving. But this one has this thing. 
and Singapore and Sri Lanka have a long relationship. During the time when I was in school, many of the teachers in mathematics, in, in science, in, even in English, used to be from Sri Lanka. Sri Lankans dominate the judiciary, they do dominate the professions, and they are in almost all parts of uh, Singapore, Malaysia. The Malaysian railway is almost completely uh, manned by Sri Lankans. So today, Sri Lanka and Singapore are described as complementary hubs. Sri Lanka has already positioned itself as a transshipment hub for the Indian Ocean. There are number of large-scale infrastructure projects underway to further enhance the country's commerce and financial connectivity. Singapore is also a maritime and business hub in Southeast Asia. Together, our countries can unlock opportunities for industry, trade, and investment. South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia are the fastest growing regions of the world. For us to, to, to collaborate and work in this environment would be, should be most rewarding. We at ISAS, we want to be fully engaged in this, what is going on. So I have talked to IPS yesterday, and we are going to have a seminar or a workshop to follow up on this, uh, this uh, event today. In other words, we want to see what are the possibilities. Our intention is to try and get interest in Singapore's sort of uh, enhance. The businessmen become more aware of what are the opportunities, what are the issues involved, and so on. So we hope to hold one uh, very soon. We are going to have something that is at the end of January, and this is on the road and uh, belt project. Uh, we have this with another think tank in Sri Lanka, Pathfinder Foundation, and we will have this, I think, 29th of January. And our intention is to, I think we, we are more or less firm, that we will have speakers from China, speakers from uh, Sri Lanka, and speakers from Singapore. And within two weeks, of our sending a flyer around to say that we are doing this, we have got now 175 registrations. This is one of the fastest uh, number of registrations being given to us in such a short while. And we think it will reach more than 200 by the time the event is held. So you can see the level of interest there is in Singapore for what is, because in the field of infrastructure, which is what uh, road and belt will be, Singapore is particularly well equipped to participate, and you can see the interest. Uh, on behalf of ISIS, I thank Minister Ishuran for agreeing to be with us today. I also thank IIPS for partnering us on, the, on this uh, at, the, at a very short notice, and thank Professor Rasin Sali for agreeing to, to moderate uh, this event. We are very happy to have that. And uh, of course, uh, our esteemed speaker will give you enough uh, ammunition, or maybe that's a bad word, uh, enough meat for you to, to have a robust discussion. He's a very good speaker, and I look forward to this very, very exciting speech. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Pillay. It's my pleasure now to invite our guest speaker, Mr. S. Ishwaran, Minister for Trade and Industry, Republic of Singapore, and Professor Rezin Selly, Chairman of IPS, and Senior Advisor to the Sri Lankan's Ministry of Finance on stage for the next segment. Professor Selly will chair the interactive session with Minister following Minister's address later. Uh, Mr. Ishwaran um, uh, was a member of the Singapore Administrative Service. Uh, he served in the ministries of Home Affairs and Education and was seconded to the uh, National Trade Union Congress and later joined the Singapore Indian Development Association as its first uh, CEO. Uh, he was Director for International Trade at the Ministry of Industry and Trade in the lead-up to Singapore's hosting 
of the WTO Ministerial Conference in 1996, which was the WTO's first, it was its inaugural uh, ministerial conference in, uh, in Suntec City. Uh, he has had uh, private sector experience uh, and has been a member of parliament uh, since uh, 1997 and a member of the cabinet uh, since uh, 2006. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Iswaran, Minister, you're uh, here at a very auspicious time. Uh, this is uh, Sri Lanka's uh, 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 third big FTA negotiation uh, and the first one uh, of those three to be, uh, to be concluded. Um, and uh, let me now hand the floor over to you for uh, some uh, preliminary uh, remarks uh, on uh, the importance of the uh, uh, Singapore-Sri Lanka FTA and indeed in the broader context of uh, Singapore-Sri uh, Lanka relations. And after that, I will uh, open it up to the floor. Over to you, Minister. Thank you, Professor Sully. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, with your indulgence, I'll just uh, make a few comments from the chair here. And then I think it will be more interesting if we have a, an interactive discussion around areas of uh, interest to you and uh, in the context of our bilateral relations. Uh, first, uh, let me thank uh, the organizing, both uh, ISAS as well as IPS here for inviting me to participate in this. And I also want to acknowledge our two high commissioners, the High Commissioner of Sri Lanka to Singapore and our non-resident High Commissioner uh, from Singapore to Sri Lanka, although I think he feels he's more resident than non-resident in recent times. Uh, but, and also I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, many other officials and uh, members of the community of uh, Sri Lanka. Um, as has already been observed several times, uh, this is quite a timely event. I, when Ambassador Gopinath Pillay asked me to do this colloquium, first thing I did was to Google colloquium, because we in the Ministry of Trade and Industry are not familiar with these terms, you know. And uh, as it turns out, it's apparently an, an academic meeting where there's a presentation followed by Q&A. I can assure you I don't intend to be academic at all. Uh, I'm just going to share with you some, some perspectives on some of the motivations behind what we have been able to achieve bilaterally, and what is the broader significance of it. So this is timely because of, of course, not just the FTA that has been signed, but also in the context of the growing momentum of uh, bilateral relations between Sri Lanka and Singapore. Prime Minister has visited Singa uh, Singapore several times. Uh, our Prime Minister is here, and we've also extended an invitation to the President and certainly many members of your cabinet and also the business community are very familiar, as indeed are the strong, deep people-to-people uh, -people ties that we have. I think the significance of the FTA uh, has several dimensions to it. The first is, of course, its bilateral uh, significance for Sri Lanka and for Singapore. For Sri Lanka, it's obviously a, a, a significant move in the context of an agreement like this being signed, um, and I think even as you have ongoing discussions with other uh, economic partners, and on Singapore's side, it is an important agreement because it's with a country like-minded in many ways and a partner with whom we can work on both bilateral and regional initiatives. Indeed, uh, I think a lot of the credit for this outcome goes to the two Prime Ministers who were significant uh, initiators of their idea and also the officials on both sides who have worked very hard on this. And I did want to acknowledge in particular Mr. Kalegama, the late Mr. Kalegama, who was very actively involved. And I had the pleasure of interacting with him, uh, very erudite, very progressive in his thinking and he laid the foundations together with our chief negotiators and team for many of the elements of this FTA. So that's a bilateral significance. I think there is an important regional significance because as has been noted, Southeast Asia and South Asia are amongst the fastest growing regions in the world. ASEAN is doing about compounded growth rates of about five to six percent. It's a collective population of about 600 million people or more. And by the end of this decade, it should reach an economic 
aggregate economic size of about three trillion US dollars. So it is a significant entity. And this year, Singapore chairs ASEAN, and we have several ideas around the themes of resilience and innovation to drive ASEAN's agenda, not just for this year, but for the foreseeable future. And in particular, the emphasis on the digital economy. On the other side, you have South Asia, where again, the growth has been at a compounded rate of about 7%, which is exceptionally high by global standards. And you're talking about a region rich with opportunities. So this FTA is also about working together to access our regional markets. And I think this is something that should not be lost. The third element in this, which I think is significant, is that we are signing an FTA at a time when the global rhetoric uh, and you could argue that there are, there's considerable anti-globalization sentiments. And it is important that we right side attitudes towards globalization. Yes, globalization can pose challenges, but it also unlocks significant opportunities for our people and our businesses. And so, whilst governments should engage in efforts to integrate their economies with larger economic entities in order to realize the value and opportunities that they present. It is equally important that governments focus on the domestic aspects because in every one of these initiatives, there are businesses, there are segments of the population, there are sectors where there needs to be targeted effort in order to enable them to participate in globalization and enjoy the benefits that go with it. So I think it is significant that two countries, Sri Lanka and Singapore, are making this move somewhat against the tide of global rhetoric, but I think with a clear eye to the future and what can be achieved. I wanted to make a couple of other points where I see the value going forward. I think for, for Sri Lanka, apart from the signal to the global community, that Sri Lanka is open for business and engaged, I think it is also an opportunity for your small and medium-sized enterprises to access not just the Singapore market, but the larger ASEAN market. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this because one of the elements of our FTA is on the area of e-commerce. And I think it is a significant milestone point because e-commerce as we would well know, is the way of the future. But the significance of e-commerce or the digital economy is really in the opportunities it unlocks for small and medium-sized enterprises. Historically, companies that have gone overseas have been those that have reached a certain size, and then they start going abroad into external markets. What we see now is even startups are going international. And if you can find ways to create uh, platforms and avenues for our businesses to go overseas, access different markets, it means you're unlocking the potential of these enterprises. So whether you are a furniture business in Samarang, or you might be in certain areas in textile business in Sri Lanka, all these companies are now able to access the global markets. And in ASEAN, we have made e-commerce a priority in the agenda for this year and as for the path forward. And this means that for Sri Lanka, it is again an opportunity to plug into the ASEAN e-commerce platform and also to reverse in terms of what can be done with India and some of the other markets of South Asia. So I think the opportunity is clear I think we are also working from a very strong base. And what I mean by this is that the cultural affinity between uh, Sri Lanka and Singapore is a strong one. We have a strong uh, community uh, from Sri Lanka who have been there for generations and made significant contributions. But importantly, we are continuing to have uh, Sri Lankans coming into Singapore and contributing in a variety of sectors. And this Cultural compatibility has been an important aspect of the business. And I think we overlay that with uh, corporate compatibility because 
I think our businesses, I have found, uh, find themselves quite adaptable to a Sri Lankan market. And we've seen this uh, a significant uptick in interest among Singapore-based businesses, especially the small and medium-sized enterprises, who find Sri Lanka an interesting market and a market they wish to pursue. And that's also reflected in aggregate data. Last year, our bilateral trade went up by about 20% in aggregate. And also, the stock of investments from Singapore to Sri Lanka went up by about 4 to 5%. And I think this FTA creates a platform from which we can build on this and work on specific sectors. The Prime Minister and the President talked about hospitality, uh, infrastructure, whether it's ports and industrial parks, and also in the consumer goods areas. I think these are sectors that offer significant areas that we can work together on for mutual benefit. So I want to conclude by saying the FTA is timely because of its significance bilaterally, the opportunity it provides for us to access regional markets, and I think the signal that it sends to the global community that like-minded countries like Sri Lanka and Singapore continue apace with economic integration and linkages even as we deal with other challenges in order to create opportunities for our people and our businesses. I'll pause there and I think we can take questions and discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for, for uh, setting the stage uh, so well. Uh, let, me, let me open it up to the floor. Uh, uh, please, uh, uh, if you have a question or a comment, uh, to the minister, uh, please uh, tell me uh, who you are and what affiliation you have, uh, if any. Who would like to start? Well, while you're thinking about it, let me break the ice. Oh, do you? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Minister. I'm Admiral Dr. Kolambagi. Since no one is asking, I thought I should break the ice. Uh, if you can elaborate a little bit more, how can Sri Lanka benefit uh, by this free trade agreement, having access to the other ASEAN countries? I, I was not quite clear on how uh, we can benefit through this FTA, uh, having access to the other ASEAN markets. Thank you, sir. I think first, uh what the FDA allows you to do is to have greater bilateral activity in Singapore, uh, you know, whether it's to export, but also to then set up operations. But why I say the FDA should go beyond and it creates opportunities for Sri Lanka is ASEAN is a collection of 10 countries. And if you think about ASEAN, it is not a homogenous block, neither economically nor politically. You have a spectrum whether, you know, politically it's from a monarchy to communist regimes to, or communist party-led regimes to democracies. If you look at uh, economic systems and in terms of economic stage of development, again, there's great diversity. And therefore, whilst the region as a whole and the ASEAN economic community in particular offers opportunities, you still need a point of entree from which one we're able to understand the nuances of the region, and two, then participate in opportunities in the region. In fact, even in Singapore, what we have, we've come to the conclusion that it's not just about, you know, uh, this is true of China, India, and certainly ASEAN. These are not monolithic, homogenous masses. In fact, the, the variety in regional terms, in provincial terms, and even at city levels are very different. So many of the multinational corporations that are in Singapore use us as a base from which to understand the variations in the regional market. And if you take Indonesia, for example, we know it's an archipelagic country. But it's more than just about the different islands, because even within just the island of Java, there are different urban centers, and they each have their own characteristics, and each are significant markets in their own right. So if I'm trying to export textiles or products in that region, or food products to Jakarta, as opposed to Surabaya, as opposed to Jogjakarta in Java, as opposed to, say, 
going to Medan in Sumatra or Makassar in the, you know, in the northeast, I think you'll find that there are significant city level, regional level variations. So as a place from which to first understand the region, as a place from which to have a relative ease of operation so that you don't have to be too seized with the business environment and so on, and a place from which to initiate new business activities. I think uh, Singapore can be very helpful. And the FTA removes any potential barriers that may be considered. The other point I would make is in the area of infrastructure, both in Sri Lanka or in South Asia, but also in ASEAN. We have emphasized uh, infrastructure development because the whole region uh, has an infrastructure deficit and we need to invest in infrastructure to raise the capacity of the economies. And in Singapore, we have a collection of uh, legal, financial, business service, and engineering capabilities, which can be applied in order to make, uh, to develop bankable infrastructure projects. It can be in the power sector, it can be roads, it can be rail, it can be airports, seaports, etc. And I think this is, again, an area which can be worked together because Sri Lanka has also got a deep professional capability. And I think the World Bank, or if you look at the World Bank and um, AIIB, ADB, etc., this is an area of focus for them as well when they look at ASEAN, South Asia, and, and the opportunities in infrastructure. So I'm just giving you some examples and about the modality. And we are trying to now take, go from this FTA to look at specific sectors and create a deeper engagement between the business communities. Let me uh, just pick up on that, uh, Minister. So one aspect of your presentation, you alluded to it briefly, was potential Singapore investor interest in Sri Lanka on the back of this FTA. Now, now this government, uh, the Prime Minister in particular, is very clear that for Sri Lanka to have more productive, sustainable growth, it needs more private sector investment, it needs more foreign investment, it also needs to be much more open to trade. All of that comes together in global value chains, so the FTA should be seen very much in that context. And in that context, of course, what we in Sri Lanka are looking for is considerably increased investment from, uh, from Singapore. You mentioned a few sectors. Perhaps you could elaborate on that a little bit. What kind of investors would be interested in Sri Lanka? In which areas? And a follow-up question. Uh, beyond the FTA, what are they or would they be looking for, for the Sri Lankan government to do to provide that welcome business environment for them to come here and flourish? I think they're important questions and let me uh, go specifically. I think uh, FTA is not just about the tariffs and the um, uh, non-tariff elements and so on and movement of, uh, you know, in terms of services, etc. An important aspect of it is there's an investment chapter there's the government procurement chapter, and uh, there's also, in the case of our FTA, an, an e-commerce uh, element and so on. And why those are important is because they create a baseline of confidence. When there's an investment chapter, then it talks about how investments will be treated in the respective countries and how uh, disputes can be resolved and the arbitration type of arrangements that can be made. It injects greater confidence in the business community, especially those which entail significant capital investment. If I'm going to invest 50, 100 million, 200 million dollars in a project uh, which is going to take, you know, 5, 10, 15 years to pay back, then I need confidence that my investment will be treated fairly and if there are any issues and disputes that can be resolved in an established manner with clarity and transparency. So I think that's an important element in this. Also, things like government procurement and so on, what it does is it signals to the community that when the government, because typically in many economies, the government is a major uh, buyer of services, etc. When the government says that it's prepared to look at, you know, open it up for contest and competition from some of the other parties, then that creates another opportunity. So quite apart from what is available in the private sector, it's also what you can do in engagement in terms of the 
public sector demand and so on. In terms of what we can do going forward to promote the investments, so the sectors, I would say, for example, uh, the whole inf uh, tourism and hospitality sector is one that is rich with potential in Sri Lanka. Um, you're blessed with uh, uh, you know, rich uh, natural assets and cultural heritage. And at the same time, um, I know that investors are looking for new possibilities in the Indian Ocean to diversify their interests and in order to access uh, new market opportunities. And I think Sri Lanka ticks all the boxes and I think it's something that can be pursued. But what it then means is the government and the agencies involved with investment promotion have to first clearly identify what are the opportunities, whether it is uh, development of tourism precincts in certain areas, whether it is uh, particular heritage buildings which could be developed into hotels or other kinds of uh, you know, hospitality infrastructure, etc. So that's the first thing. Secondly, what are the rules of engagement? What is available? What, what are they expected to comply with? And thirdly, then facilitate the business contact with the relevant government departments as well as potential local partners. I think that will unlock a lot of potential. We're already seeing uh, interest in this space. Um, tomorrow at the business forum, there will be some MOUs signed, and some of them are actually in the area of hospitality. Similarly, um, in the whole consumer business area, I think there are interesting possibilities. Um, we've talked about, for example, um, one of our F&B uh, players in Singapore, uh, Food Republic, they are here and they are investing significantly in order to develop uh, a certain type of brand and offering in, in uh, Sri Lanka. I'm also, uh, you know, I've seen interest in various other development uh, projects, uh, infrastructure around the ports and around industrial parks. I think it's an area where already some of our companies are here uh, doing some of the master planning and so on, and going beyond the planning to look at specific opportunities where development can be made. So I think what we need to do at the next stage, uh, this is both from a Sri Lankan perspective, but uh, to some extent also uh, needs to have some traction in the Singapore side, is really to first clearly identify the sectors of priority, the specific opportunities that you see, and how the government is facilitating investments in those sectors and then getting the business matching going. And this is an area that we discussed with uh, the, president and the Prime, uh, president of Sri Lanka and the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka today and also uh, uh, some of the ministers in the cabinet in terms of taking this forward. So the FTA, whilst it is a significant achievement, is really the starting point for the next phase. And we'll see a lot more of that. And, and happily, we're already seeing uh, investment interest. And I was particularly struck that many of our small and medium-sized enterprises from Singapore are already coming to Sri Lanka. And this is no mean feat, you know, because uh, uh, when we try and take them to places in India and so on, it's a struggle. Because I think they are overwhelmed by the size and they need to break it down into uh, digestible opportunities. I think Sri Lanka offers them a much clearer value proposition and all the other reasons I enumerated earlier, I think, add to the allure. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I note uh, the Director General of the Board of Investment is here, uh, as is the, uh, the head of the government's uh, uh, PPP unit. Uh, so I, I hope they've taken note. Uh, who, would, uh, who would like to uh, raise the next point, ask the next question? Don't feel shy. Yes, John. Uh, I'm Janaka from the Institute of Policy Studies. Uh, Minister, in your uh, talk, you mentioned about this uh, tide uh, against uh, globalization. Uh, and in this respect, I would want to know, like, in Singapore, what has been the reception of Singapore uh, signing agreements and to what extent the government has done to uh, sort of build confidence of people who are against uh, such deals because we in Sri Lanka have that source of yes. voices. Uh, so how has Singapore gone about addressing these concerns? 
So I can't comment uh, uh, knowledgeably on the Sri Lankan situation, but let me share with you our experience. First of all, um, in Singapore, at the point of independence, uh, a decision was made by our founding uh, fathers that we have to be open and invite investments in order to basically build the economy. And this was counterintuitive in that era. If you think about the 60s, it was a lot about nationalism and uh, you know the MNCs were seen as uh, the new form of colonialism, etc., etc. Whereas we just took the position. And sometimes, you know, uh, when your back is against the wall, you have laser-like clarity on what you need to do. And so because we didn't have many options, it was a clear strategy and we went about it. And in the process, of course, we invested significantly in our people and their capabilities uh, in order to be able to meet the needs of these investors coming in, so in terms of skills, education skills, and so on. And also creating a business environment that's conducive for businessmen to come in and operate. So the, our trade agenda in Singapore, whether it is in the multilateral fora like the WTO, whether it is in regional or plurilateral fora like ASEAN and uh, APEC and TPP, etc., or in bilateral contexts like the Sri Lanka-Singapore FTA, we see these as a lattice structure of reinforcing agreements. We want them to be open. We want them to create new pathways for engagement in order to build a larger opportunity set for our people mutually for the countries that we engage with. So that's the approach we have taken consistently. And I think lest uh, it be misconstrued, we have our own political challenges in Singapore. Whether it is in terms of uh, openness, in terms of trade and investments, uh, in terms of technology and its adoption, uh, there are many concerns. For, I'll give you an example. Uh, the question is, can we uh, create a more protected environment for our SMEs in the Singapore context because then they can do more business in Singapore before they go abroad. And our response to that has been, look, if we protect you, you are not going to be competitive enough to go overseas because you're going to be operating in a very sheltered environment and it is not the condition precedent for the kind of competitive enterprises that you need. Rather, we take the approach of, look, we will work with you to develop your capabilities. So whether that is in terms of, uh, in the case of some, some sectors, uh, research and development, whether it is in terms of creating collaborative platforms between SMEs in the same sector or even with some of the bigger boys in the sector and see how you can transfer capabilities and technology. And certainly in the area of training your people, investing in their capacity and so on. So that's been a major part. And if you look at, say, technology, you know, there's great concern around robotics, around uh, data analytics, artificial intelligence, and is this going to displace large swaths of uh, workers, and how do we deal with it? And, and again, you know, our unions and our workers have a similar concern. If a robot comes and does these jobs, then what am I going to be doing in future? And our response to them has been, if we don't bring in the technology and do it, Somebody else will, and then the whole business will go away. So you've got to keep it in perspective that the f starting point must be that we have to stay competitive and relevant. So rather than take a defensive approach, we, we embrace the technology, and then we say, look, whatever the technology, you still need human intervention, you need human machine interface, etc. So how can we turn this into an advantage? How can we empower you through skills, through other opportunities, so that you can participate in this new economy, in the new set of opportunities that are emerging? And I think this is the important element that's missing when we talk about whether it's Brexit or, or, or you know, some of the rhetoric you hear in the US or elsewhere and so on. Because the reality is you can't just talk about economic integration or efforts without talking about complementary domestic policy to raise the skill levels, capability of the people and also the capacity of our enterprises to engage in this new form of economic activities. 
So I think that is the part that is missing in the discussion. So to say the problem is all about uh, globalization is really miss, is, you know, it's a false construct because that's only one part of the equation and you've got to look at what is your response and policy response. So the short answer is we have our fair share of challenges. Even now, I can cite a bunch of things that we're trying to do and deal with some of the issues and challenges. But really the, the dominant narrative and compact that we've established with our people and our workers and enterprises is that yes, there are the challenges that go with these initiatives, but rather than seek to immunize ourselves and protect ourselves from these changes, it is better that we embrace them, adapt to them, and turn them into an advantage wherever we can. And that's really been the, the approach we've taken over the last 50 years, over different cycles in, in different sort of uh, areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, I was told to wrap up this session at 6.30. Is that right, uh, Sitara? Okay. Uh, do you have time for one more question, Minister? Uh, yes, the lady, the lady over there at the back. Uh, Minister Iswaran, I'm Charita from News First. Um, there was a proposal in the budget to liberalize Sri Lanka's shipping industry. Um, and there are concerns, again, the protectionist uh, theory. I would like to know how Singapore overcame this uh, when you decided to become a hub. Sorry, concerns regarding what? I didn't quite get. The liberalization of the shipping industry. Okay. I'm not familiar with what are the specific uh, budget well, ideas. Uh, um, in the, uh, uh, the Minister of Finance in his inaugural budget announced uh, the full removal of uh, foreign equity restrictions mm. on shipping agencies and on freight forwarders. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, still, to be, still to be implemented, but uh, the, the idea was to send a clear signal that these sectors hitherto closed or partially closed would be now open to the world and that this would be very much part of Sri Lanka uh, attempting to become a South Asia hub in the Indian Ocean. Thank you. I, that's helpful. Um, one of the lessons I've learned uh, is uh, I'm never sufficiently equipped to comment on domestic issues in other countries. Sometimes even in my own country it's a bit of a challenge. So, But let me try and address the point uh, from both a conceptual and also from what Singapore has done perspective. Conceptually, the question is, is Sri Lanka uh, or any country, if you want to be a hub, it means you're part of a network. And this is true for whether, you know, you're talking about logistics or, you know, it can be even about financial services, etc. And the important thing about networks is that if you want to be an important node in a network, then you have to be connected to the network and the returns grow as the network grows, your network linkages grow. So Singapore is a transshipment hub. We want to build our links to as many uh, economies and regions as possible. You can make the same argument about airports, you can make the same argument about financial services, etc. But the key point is, once you decide that you want to be an effective node in a network and you want to play an important role, then you have to allow the different players to come and be a part of that node. Because unless they are a part of that node, they cannot be effectively involved in the network that you're trying to establish. So shipping that you've uh, described and therefore freight forwarding, etc. I mean, this is all part of the value chain. But the broader point is really, if we decide that network uh, elements are important to us because of the nature of the economy, then our policies must support that and encourage that. That's the approach we have taken. And uh, I think it may be a different argument if you're a very large country and you've got your own setup. But for smaller economies like in Singapore, we have been quite clear what we need to do is create the ambient conditions so that the logistics players, the financial players, the, uh, you know, all those involved in cross-border movement of goods, people, capital, etc., and all of these 
find an environment that is conducive and hospitable. Thank you, Minister. Uh, one last, one last question, perhaps. Uh, any, 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 any takers? If not, then let me uh, let me uh, close this session. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Minister, for uh, not just setting the stage. Uh, but responding so imaginatively and comprehensively uh, to, uh, to, to the questions, which uh, I think gives the audience uh, a, a sense of uh, not only what makes Singapore tick, uh, but also how relations between our two countries uh, can, uh, can grow ever better. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. May I also invite Ambassador Gurbinath Pillay on stage for the signing, please. The MOU signed by the Chairman of both the Institutes, Ambassador Gopinath Pillay and Prof. Professor, Robin, Professor Razin Sally, and is witnessed by a Minister. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you, Ambassador Pillay and Prof. Razin Sally. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of today's session. We have, Minister had to actually leave for another event, a very important event with the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, so he has taken his leave. But thank you, everyone, for being with us today. It has been a pleasure always to be in Colombo and to have such a significant event. Thank you very much, and please do join us at the foyer for our tea reception. See you again at the next event, and all the best. Good evening. <laughs>